The Humanities Council of Washington, D.C. is proud to present Freedoms, Rights, and Responsibilities, a series of programs supported by the National Endowment for the Humanities' We the People initiative, dedicated to exploring significant themes and events in U.S. history and sharing the lessons with all Americans. Before we say one more word, Mr. Dean, let, let, me, let me just offer you our hearts. Our campus is a skating rink, and you skated all the way to us tonight, some braving the elements from all over the Northeast Corridor and from the Midwest. Now, our one, one announcement I have to make before I address you. This is an unpleasant one. This is a heartbreaking one. I want to get it over with. Our beloved Lucille Clifton is somewhere right now between earth and sky. We hope she's safe. There was a blizzard where she was. Then there were winds. She's trying to get here. But we, what we want her to be is safe, and we hope, against hope, that she may arrive at midnight before we all turn to pumpkins. <laughs> now, officers of the university, the dean, Mr. Dean, Madam Dean of the Division of the Humanities, distinguished honorees, Professors Emeriti, alumni and alumni of the Department of English at Howard, honored guests, colleagues, students, beloved all. On behalf of the Department of English, please accept our hearts in gratitude and love for doing what I said. I forgot I had said that. I forgot I had written it in my remarks, Mr. Dean. I'm thanking people for braving ice, wind, sleet, and snow, and all the elements that pour forth to be with us on this wintry but wonderful night. Some of you have been without electrical power for three days, but tonight we promise to restore the power of your own loveliness and turn all the lights back on you. Many of you have given us your steadfast support over 13 years of our effort to fully fund a distinguished chair in the name of a representative pioneer who established the study of African American literature in the academy. And for that act of faith and love, I am telling you, <laughs> we ain't going until we get the job done. <laughs> Hearts Day, as we call this occasion, is the day on which the Department of English emphasizes and calls the university to emphasize appreciation of our heritage. In celebrating our forebears, we celebrate what Lucille Clifton calls generations. We celebrate what Mary Evans calls the young and black and beautiful in pursuit of ancient freedom dreams. We celebrate what Nikki Giovanni calls a for real black Thing called revolution, known to revolutionists as love. Tonight, we welcome you to this rare opportunity to visit with these women who pioneered a revolution in language from which the world has never recovered and never should. Only insanity would provoke a person to attempt an introduction of Lucille Clifton, Mari Evans, and Nikki Giovanni. These are persons known throughout the globe as bold and fearless speakers for human feeling and 
thought and action in our humanly troubled world. Only a person comatose for 30 odd years would not know that these poets, essayists, writers of children's books, playwrights, editors, and activists remain leading voices in a generational battle against what poet Chuck D calls dumb assification and anti-intellection, meaning anti-intellectualism. That generational battle and all those who struggle to deliver us from the chains of dumb assification is what the Department of English at Howard celebrates as Hearts Day. We are honoring tonight three women whose work in poetry and in every other spoken art or written art has revolutionized thought, has challenged us, as Mary Evans has put it, to claim our right to participate in the process of defining excellence, of setting standards, of determining value, of calling down power. Throughout the day, we have hosted a conversation by way of a national conference where scholars address the achievements of these, our revolutionary writerly honorees. I can't tell you about this conversation as the dean could not, because like Paul Lawrence Dunbar said, you ought to heard it for yourself. <laughs> but you will be able to read about it because it's hot for publication and publishers, publishers are begging our conference coordinator, Dr. Dana Williams, for these proceedings and they're gonna get them. For 40 years, a revolutionist named Sterling Allen Brown taught at this university. He wrote a poem called Strong Men, The Strong Men. The lines read, strong men keep coming on, strong men getting stronger. He was not, of course, excluding women. Lucille Clifton was his in-the-class student. Mari Evans and Nikki Giovanni have acknowledged him as father, forebear of contemporary African-American poetry. Strong men keep a coming on, getting stronger. Sterling Brown was talking about generations. He was always talking about generations. He wrote a poem whose hero and speaker was an old farmer in winter dreaming about planting his spring garden. He dreams butter beans for Clara, sugar cane for Grace, and for the little fella, running space. Sterling Brown created running space for little fellas like Lucille Clifton, A.B. Spellman, Leroy Jones becoming Amity Baraka, and Toni Morrison right here in the Department of English at Howard University for 40 years. Here, he also pioneered the study of African-American literature in the academy. It started here and at Morgan State University, where Dr. Griffin comes from, and Atlanta University, where I come from. And now you can hardly find enough faculty to supply its demands. Poet, scholar, anthologist, editor, activist Sterling Brown fathered a generation of writers embraced by the generational name called the Black Arts Movement. The Black Arts Movement sits in this room tonight. And it has followed, has fathered, it is the acknowledged parents. Do you want me to call all their names? I'm not gonna do it. Because then I would be in defiance of Boxdale and I would be in defiance of this program because we have to get out of here before. <laughs> They are the acknowledged parents of the present hip hop generation of revolutionists against dumb assification, represented on the faculty of the Department of English by poet Tony Medina, a leading voice of that generation, who in turn is nurturing the coming generation of revolutionary poets. All of this is the reason why we name this day in our lives, Hearts Day, because on this day we celebrate our life's blood, the blood of intelligence, courage, 
and beautiful generational birthing that ran through the veins of our forebears and continues to be transmitted to us, empowering us to fight the battle against dumb acidification and anti-intellectualism, which is our mission. The proof of this mission sits with us in our audience. Ms. Hardy, Ms. McCoy, if they are not here, I'm going to have a heart attack. Is Chris Britton in this office? Chris? Chris Batten? Stand up, sir. Oh, there he is. Eric Massey, is he here? He's coming. Chris Batten and Eric Massey, Mr. Dean, were my freshman orientation mentees. They are now on deck for graduation in May 07. And will Philip Batten please stand? Philip Batten, Mr. Dean, is the young brother of Chris Batten, the now famous Bison star, who is a freshman this year. And he is destined for graduation in what? I can't count, Haki, 8, 9, 10, 11. <laughs> and now, standing with me to prove this mission, Dr. McClellan, begin to come forward. Drums beat a little bit. <laughs> I know you're sitting down. We need to beat a little bit for this father, Mr. Dean, whose life we saved. There would have been a patricide had we not graduated last year. Drew McClellan, <laughs> who said, Dr. Trey, if I don't graduate, it'll kill my father. I said, no, son, we can't let you do that. Drew, a film major, graduated last year. And Drew developed an affection for the English department. Please take a bow, department. And gave us his father, Dr. Drew McClellan. I won't tell you about this man. He is a great financier. And he has agreed to be the Honorary Chairman of Hearts Day 2007. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Trailer. And in an uh, in immovable way, I'm, I'm sort of now daunted. It's a daunting task to follow her. Um, Dr. Trailer and I have guests. Uh, I am Hassel McClellan, and it is true what you said. I would have killed my son. I promised him. I told him, I don't threaten, I promise. And I, he was scheduled to graduate, and uh, I was very happy that he did. Uh, to the honored guests and everyone who conceived with, along with Dr. Trailer and contributed to really making to the day's events and this evening uh, event possible, I am honored to have been asked to serve as the really as the honorary chair, and to participate in the celebration of three magnificent individuals, and also to offer in some small way support for the endowment of the Sterling A. Brown chair, which is vital and critical uh, for everyone. You know, although as a, as a business school professor and former dean uh, I'm at, at Boston College, it, it might seem a little out of character for me. Uh, I've also been considered a call by my students a number slut. Uh, I was an economics and math major. So it might be a little out of character to be here uh, at the English department to, to support this activity. But if any of you who know Dr. Trailer know that she's not someone you say no to easily. In, in fact, I learned from my father uh, an experience that there are some people that ask, but they're not really asking, they're just being polite. <laughs> and Dr. Trailer is one of those individuals, so I could not say no. Secondly, she did refer to my son, Drew, who is uh, very pleased on his way to being a, a budding filmmaker and, and waiting to hear from graduate school. When he decided to uh, attend college and he wanted, decided he want, did not want to do anything dull like dad, and he wanted to be a filmmaker and follow in his 
footsteps in the arts of his, of his sister, I encouraged him to major in English because I thought it was important. I said, if you're going to be a film major, you need to read extensively, learn to write well, learn to recognize and how to tell a good story. And English is no better preparation for that. Little did I know that he would fall under the spell and guidance of Dr. Trailer and Ms. Hart and others, and for that I am eternally grateful, and I appreciate all you've done for Drew. This event is also special for me in another way, and unbeknownst to Dr. Taylor, it has allowed me to briefly reacquaint myself with two individuals whose paths crossed mine, and I hate to say this, Nikki and Joanne, over 40 years, about 40 years ago, uh, when Nikki uh, and I were class, well, she was a year ahead of me. <laughs> when we were fellow students at Fisk University, that other great university, and Joanne Gavin, with whom, uh, whose husband and I were classmates at, in graduate school and struggling, and we were all trying to find our way, and Joanne was a very special person then, and she has simply gone on to share her specialness with you in her work professionally and as an individual. So it was a real treat when I looked on the program and saw that there were two individuals that I knew from many years ago and I had a chance to see again. After accepting Dr. Trailer's command, not invitation to become the honorary chair, uh, as a number slut, I decided I'd better go to the dictionary and find out exactly what a poet is. So I went to the dictionary. And it, my dictionary said, a poet is one who is especially gifted in the perception and expression of the beautiful and or lyrical. One who is especially gifted in the perception and expression of the beautiful or lyrical. Beautiful thoughts, words, phrases that make us feel exalted, humble, reflective, sad, angry, triumphant, and filled with wonderment and amazement, and appreciation for those who can compose and share with us, us mere hackers of the English language. We have been blessed and graced today and this evening by a number of poets and to be in the presence of three honorees whose perception of beauty has enlightened us all. It is a joy and honor to be in this place at this time at Howard University. And yet, standing in this place at Howard University, even to a Fisk graduate like Nikki and myself, it is even more special. For Howard University, and the English department, in particular Dr. Trailer, has been like a faucet dripping on a pond, whose droplets create ripples that spread across the entire surface of the pond, touching and gently disturbing the surface, and yet leaving it readily receptive to those ripples that will follow. Those droplets being students and others who have passed through the doors of the English Department of Howard University. The impact of Howard University's English Department can be seen in the droplets who become giants in the pond or the field of perceiving and expressing beauty. Howard University's English Department with Dr. Triller's hand on the faucet and before her Sterling A. Brown Elaine Locke and others have not only caused ripples in the field, but have been midwives to the birth of writers, novelists, and poets, and curators to genius. Zora Neale Houston, Amari Baraka, Lucille Clifton, and the Tony Morrisons who have passed through these doors. Individuals who have become giants as poets, writers, and expressors of beauty. As someone once said, however, if I have seen further, it is because I have stood on the shoulders of giants. And those giants from Howard have become giants because they have stood on the shoulders of other giants, Dunbar, Wheatley, Hayden, Hughes, and even Ju Jupiter Hammond, the first African American to actually publish literature in 17 1761. Howard University's English department continues to send forth individuals into the universe that is composed of those who express and perceive the beautiful as well as those whose ability to perceive and express themselves serve as a foundation for success in law, business, publishing, film, and other careers and lifelong pursuits. We must continue to strengthen the shoulders upon which future giants will be, un be, unable, will be enabled to see farther by enabling Howard University to attract outstanding faculty. 
In the universe of those who practice the art and educate others to perceive the beautiful and to express the beautiful and lyrical, no constellation of stars should shine brighter than the constellation that is composed of faculty and students that reside at Howard University. Support for the endowment of the Sterling A. Brown Fellowship is one step to ensuring that the formation of the constellation of stars composed of faculty and students and alumni will continue to produce giants in the perception and expression of, of the beautiful and no constellation anywhere else in the world will outshine the constellation of stars that should reside here. I thank you for coming this evening and supporting the department, the university's initiatives, especially Hearts Day and the Sterling A. Brown Endowed Fellowship. A tribute then to have your protégés and peers come before you to express their gratitude and love for what you have done and what you meant to them and what your work means to the world, speaking truth to life, if you will. And now we will have the tributes from just a few of the many folks who would want to be here. Amari Baraka could not be here. Sonia Sanchez was a victim of the weather. She could not be here. But there are others who are here. And as I've mentioned before, we'd like to end the program before midnight. And we also would like to also extend a very warm courtesy to our honorees because we really want to hear from them. You want to hear from them, am I right? Yes, indeed. So to those who are providing the tributes, we ask that you would limit them to no more than two minutes. We know you love them. We know you care. But we also need you to be brief. So please, as I call your name, please come forward to express your personal tribute to the ladies of the hour. First up is Miss Dolores Kendrick. She is the second Poet Laureate of the District of Columbia. She succeeded uh, Sterling Brown, who had that title first in 1984. She was awarded and bestowed that title in 1999. Please welcome Ms. Dolores Kendrick. about these books is just something I'm going to quote for them, so I'm try to hold this down as much as possible. Uh, my father was Ike Kendrick, who published the first all-around community newspaper in D.C., chronicling the life and times of the African-American community. And he was an avid tennis player and a tennis partner to his great friend, Sterling Brown. Once following a Sterling Brown reading at the Library of Congress, a reception was held in Sterling's honor. At that reception, uh, Sterling talked with me about my work and encouraged me to continue to nurture my talent and my vision. Very excited over that meeting, I went home and told my father that I had just met Sterling Brown. You have just met Sterling Brown, he asked, and I said, he said, where? And I mentioned the reading and reception. Dolores, you met Sterling Brown when you were three years old on a Banica tennis court on Georgia Avenue. And then I remembered my father and Sterling liked to hold court with one another after, and after their tennis game, and my dad held my hand tightly during their conversation. But whenever Sterling got the upper hand in the discussion, my father would squeeze my fingers. So that I had remembered of Sterling from that time was synonymous with sore fingers. The beauty here is that I was destined to follow Sterling as Poet Laureate of the District and the second Poet Laureate in the history of the District through the efforts of E. Ethelbert Miller, who's sitting down there, and I wish you would stand, Ethelbert, because he made that possible. <laughs> stand, Ethelbert. <laughs> Thank you. Such memories are what poems are made of, poems that have a voice as well as a vision. Gwendolyn Brooks poems, Komiyaka poems, A. Van Johnson poems, Sam Allen poems, uh, Ethelbert Miller poems, Haki poems, poems that are not the husbandry of well-selected words on a page with no specific passion or identity. The poems that poet laureate Donald Hall writes so brilliantly about using the McDonald metaphor, a billion million served every year. 
These poems fulfill the definition of verse rather than poetry. But I speak of poems that have a life of their own long after the life of the poet has uh, fled or succumbed into nothing more than dialogue. Here we celebrate a Lucille Clifton poem, a poem that marinates as it masters the universe. I'll just make a short quote from that uh, a poem by Lucille Clifton. And it is 1994, I was leaving my 85th, 58th year when a thumb of ice stamped itself near my heart. You have your own story. You know what the fears, the tears, the scar of disbelief. You know the saddest lies are the ones we tell ourselves. You know how dangerous it is to be born with breasts. You know how dangerous it is to wear dark skin. I was leaving my 58th year when I woke into the winter of a cold mortal body, the ice sickles hanging off the one mad nipple weeping or a poem that pursues its craft and enjoins life with, uh, with art, as in Mari Evans' When in Rome, which is a very stunning uh, poem I wish to share with you, When in Rome by Mari Evans. Uh, let's see, here it is. Uh, sorry. Mari, Marie dear, the box is full. Take whatever you like to eat. An egg or soup, there ain't no meat. There's endive there and cottage cheese. Whew, if I had some black-eyed peas. There's sardines on the shelves and such, but don't get my anchovies. They cost too much. Me get the anchovies indeed. What she thinks she got a bird to feed? There's plenty in there to fill you up. Yes, I'm just the size enough. Hope I lives till I get home. I'm tired of eating what, what they eats in Rome. <laughs> or a poem by Nikki Giovanni as uh, in the wrong kitchen. Uh, here is a brief excerpt from that poem, In the Wrong Kitchen by Nikki Giovanni. Um, we d didn't know then why I played my radio all night and why I kept the light burning. We thought back then it was my hair that was nappy. So we tried to make it all right, straightening the wrong kitchen. Uh, both Lucille Clifton and Nikki Giovanni wrote critically generous comments on the dust cover of my own book, The Women of Plums. So we are colleagues of a sort. The voice is, and that is now in its 18th year of publication, and it is a privileged association that I share with them. Lucille Clifton is the author of several books of poetry, including Good Woman, Poems and Memoirs from 1969 to 1980, which was nominated for a Pulitzer. Her honors include an Emmy and a Shelley Memorial Award, and in 1999, she was elected Chancellor of the American Academy of Poets and has served as Poet Laureate of Maryland. Marie has long been a sustaining presence in not only the African-American scene, but also the literary culture of our times. Uh, she, her poetry has appeared in over 200 anthologies, and she is a poet, a playwright, an essayist, an educator, and has taught at many universities, including Cornell and Spelman College. Her latest collection of poems is from uh, Black uh, Classic Press. And, um, and finally, uh, Nikki asked the, uh, entered the literary world at the height of the black arts movement. Truth is on its way. A recording of her poems recited to gospel music was one of the best selling albums in the country in 1971. She has received a host of honorary doctorates and awards. Her books include Racism, Black Feeling and Love Poems. She is professor of English at Virginia Polytechnic Institute and State University, and she has also been a colleague of mine as we were both published by William Morrow and Company in New York. We celebrate these poets today in their faithfulness in their art, their vision, and their humanity, the human condition of which Sterling Brown himself was witness and master. For all of the created spirits here tonight, including that of Sterling Brown, we share the gift immortalized in the words of Gwendolyn Brooks 
and we, as we gather in her words to civilize a space in which to play your violin with grace. Our next tribute will be given by a, a young man that I always love to meet. Um, he is a very humble man. He's full of humility. And his humanity is always overflowing. And you cannot be in his presence and not be changed just by the quietness of this man who is very powerful in all that he does. I'm speaking of E. Ethelbert Miller. He's going to be our next person to provide tribute. He's the board chair of the Institute for Policy Studies. He's also a literary activist, director of the African American Resource Center here at Howard University, and a truly a giant in the literary world. Please welcome E. Ethelbert Miller. I was in the middle of growing an afro when I discovered the beauty of black poetry. In my single room in Cook Hall dormitory, the slender broadside press books found a place to squat between political science and economic textbooks. The names of black poets became as familiar to my lips as the names of singing groups. After the Temptations, the Four Tops, the Dells, the Delphonics, after the Miracles, came Don L. Lee and a Mary Baraka. But after Aretha came Nikki. And with Nikki came black feeling, black talk, and black judgment. Her words made you wish you were born in Knoxville, Tennessee. You wanted the tasty okra, greens, and barbecue. You wanted to go barefoot, even if you were from the South Bronx, like me. Nikki Giovanni wrote the poems that introduced you to poetry. Her book, My House, is still a favorite. Who cannot forget these sweet words? I only want to be there to kiss you as you want to be kissed, when you need to be kissed, when I want to kiss you, because it's my house, and I plan to live in it. Hmm. These are the types of words that told a black man to get his act together. The poetry of Nikki Giovanni threatened to kidnap you before the days of terrorism. It warned you that its lines and images would wrap you in red, black, and green. The poetry of Nikki Giovanni gave us a new consciousness without which we would still curse our Negro ways. When Nikki Giovanni read her poetry with gospel music. She became Mahalia, and every black person who heard her whispered, precious Lord, take my hand, or was it peace, be still. We all testified back in the 1970s that this woman could fly like a bird in the sky. Back in the 1970s, when I would visit one of my mentors, Dr. Stephen Henderson, in his small office in Founders Library, he would be eating his half smokes. And now and then he would talk about the black aesthetic and blues aesthetic. How did we become so black and blue? Henderson would talk about Sterling Brown, Frank Marshall Davis, Leon DeMoss. He would talk about Michael Harper and John Killens. He would talk about Pinky Gordon Lane and Gwendolyn Brooks. But he would stop chewing his half smokes when it came to the work of Mary Evans. Evans was one of Henderson's favorite black women poets. The others were probably June Jordan and Sarah Webster Fabio. There is something about the poetry. No, there is something about the woman Mary Evans. If you had to find one word to describe her, it would be grace. Grace. OK, let's make it two. Amazing grace. When I think of Indianapolis, I don't think of car racing or the Colts. 
I don't even think of Madam Walker. I think first of Mary Evans. I thought of her first when I placed her face on 12 stamps coming out of Africa. I selected Mary Evans for this honor because she reminded all of us to always speak the truth to the people. When I think of black womanhood in all its splendor, I think of the talented Mary Evans, the composer, playwright, poet, photographer, a woman for all seasons. How can a person not look to her to be renewed? How could a person like myself struggling to become a poet not realize that the words by Evans about speaking the truth to the people was advice for poets as well as presidents. Reading the poetry of Mary Evans was a guide into blackness when the world was still illuminated by Negro lights. Around 1974, a man wearing coveralls and bringing the Southern Road with him appeared on the campus of Howard University. He was a man who had a journal called Hoodoo. Before I had even met him, he had rejected my small poems, my verse, my sweet things, and simply said in a note, I like how you move through these words, but this is not hoodoo poetry. The man was Amazu Bolton. When American English departments discovered their roots, they were to rediscover the books of Amos. It was this man who kept talking about Lucille Clifton to me. I couldn't tell if Clifton was an ordinary woman or a two-headed woman. I knew some of her short poems hit me in the head and spun me like a top. I couldn't get around the hips in her poems without reading them aloud and dancing. The poetry of Clifton made you go back to your Bible. Amos never told me if the poetry of Lucille Clifton was who do poetry. Over the years, I've come to the realization, however, that Clifton's work is spiritual and uplifting. In his introduction to Mary Evans' Black Women Writers, 1950 to 1980, Stephen Henderson described the writing of Black Women Writers as being the revolution within the revolution. The work of these women moved beyond simply changing American literary landscape. They change our political, social, and cultural structures. These women are not just writers, they are institutions. Their books are places you want to visit and not just read about. I remember Nikki Giovanni once talking about going to Mars. Well, tonight, the planets will have to wait because the stars are out. And their work and their careers have given birth to brightness. Sterling Brown once said, they don't come by ones. They don't come by twos. Well, I guess they come in threes. <laughs> Nikki Giovanni, Mary Evans, Lucille Clifton, thank you for your genius and your grace. Yes, and he's a Howard man. We've got him. And we are so blessed to have him. To pay honor and tribute next is Miss Joanne Gavin. She's the executive director of Furious Flower Poetry Center. Please welcome her this evening. been fabulous. What about those Paul singers? I mean, this is wonderful. It's great to be here. I'm going to take just two minutes with this tribute to three wonderful sisters. You are light, moon spark, and star shine, a brilliant constellation in our sky, oracle, wit and blessing, goddesses, spirits reigning on the land. You are spiritual, blues, gospel, riffing arpeggios of soul. You are dancers moving the earth, wintergreen women with evergreen life. You show us the way to mountains even in our struggle in the fog. Furious flowers all, revolutionaries, regenerating poetry, rageful 
and resolute. Riffing, rapping, truth to power. We love you for loving us. You will always be in our hearts. Brown would call you Boutasius. He would also call you strength. Strong women getting stronger. Strong women stronger. I would simply call you my sisters. And last but not least, uh, I'm so glad that the brothers are represented because, you know, brothers don't really think that we enjoy poetry that much, but we have two foremost people here who have actually written some of the greatest words that ever have come from a pen. And up next is a senior poet, founder and president of Third World Press. The name itself just exudes lyricism and expressiveness, and I'm so glad that I was a part of the Howard experience in the 70s and 80s to have experienced him live and direct. Haki Mahabuti, please welcome him. <laughs> we are the stories we are told. Each tale creates boundaries in our voices. We answer to names that are not ours. Too many of our African bones are buried in foreign soils and our children are taught by people who do not love them. Enter the mountains of truth. Enter the raindrops of wisdom. Enter the valley of right voices. Enter the waves of the dark seas. Enter the geography of new continent. Enter the enlightened heat of black and black. Enter the quality of first thoughts. These three are the women of first thoughts. This tribute is in keeping with in the tradition of honoring our own. Before us are three of the most significant and unique poets of the 20th and 21st centuries. As John Oliver Killens would say, they are long distant runners. I met each of them during the 60s, that difficult and self-defining years, which roughly means I've been in touch with them and their work close to 40 years, which in itself is almost an impossibility for none of them have reached the age of 50. Each of these fine writers, poets, Mari Evans and Lucille Clifton and Nika Giovanni, they represent a clearing that is in their work, the defining idea, they give us who we are and the beauty, the complexity within that, within that definition is always given serious consideration and examination. They, in their work, have not only taken on us, but have explored and reflected upon in carefully crafted poems and prose that singular mission that serious artists grapple with and keep us intact. Against tremendous odds, these women, they have given us in all of their work what we would call liberation narratives. Reading and digesting the best of Evans, Clifton, and Giovanni always demand that we search subsurface for the historical, genetic, cultural, and binding traditions that have allowed and encouraged us to withstand, survive, and endure the greatest horror to ever visit a people, the enslavement, and the psychological and physical negation of an entire people that continues to this very day. These poets, these writers, 
among, among many others, have stated in their own magical language, magical queries, that any people who are in control of their own cultural imperatives, you will find among them functioning, dedicated, creative artists who are, quiet as is kept, the freest among us. These free women, they represent the best of us because it is the artists who question madness among leaders and family. It is the artists who demand fairness in a new, new world. It is the artists who does not settle for the easy answers and ineffective conclusions. It is the artists who have taught us to rise above the limited expectation of others and ourselves. It is the artists, especially women, and these three leading the way in helping us to confront white supremacy, sexism, homophobia, ageism, classism, and much of the backward and antiquated thinking that most of us have been reared in. It is the artists who see beyond reality to work within the unseen. They are the creators. They're the ones. They're the visionaries. They give us hope. They give us possibilities. They know deep in their bones that wrapping reality is very easy. Anybody can stand on the corner of Georgian Avenue and rap reality. But the poets, they poured about a greater future, requiring family, requiring vision, deep learning, historical understanding, cultural immersion, community, sharing elders, even though some of us do not wish to be elders. It requires ritual and much, much more. They know that we stand on tall shoulders. It is these, the artists, who take no prisoners in the fight for justice and who understand that the office and intelligence do not always go together. Flames from sun, fire enduring rainbow nights, the women are colors of earth and ocean. Earth as life, the beginning waters, magnificent energy. As the women go, so go the people, determining mission, determining possibilities. Stopping the women stops the future. To understand slavery, fill the eyes of mothers. There lies hope, even the destruction. Lies unspeakable horror, our fruitful destiny. We are now in the Europe of our song. Non-melody with little beat our hope. Current dreams are visionless, producing behavior, absence of greatness. Without great teachings, without important thoughts, without significant deeds, the ordinary emerges as accepted example, gluing the women to kitchens, afternoon soaps, and the limiting imaginations of sightless men, producing the people that move with the quickness of decapitated bodies, while calling such movement divine. Possibilities. Listen to the wind of women, the voices of Big Mama, Zora Neale, Sister Rosa, Fanny Lou, Pretty Renee, Gwen Brooks, Queen Nzinga, Lucille Clifton, Mari Evans, Nikki Giovanni, and warrior mothers. All birth and prophecy, black and heart warm, bare and precise. The women detailing the coming collapse arise, the best and bent of youth emerging, telling triumphantly if we listen, if we feel, and if we prepare. Thank you for being with us this evening.
We are almost there, ladies and gentlemen, and give yourselves a hand for being so gracious this evening. It has been a long day, it's been a blessed day, and we thank everyone for being here with us as we come to a moment where we actually hear from those that we honor this evening. You know, it has been said that you really can't understand and appreciate music unless you really understand and appreciate the spaces between the notes, because you really can't have music without the spaces between the notes. You can have words on a page, but if you don't understand the moment and the movement and the essence of the words and the meaning behind the words, then in essence, you really don't have literature. And in fact, to be able to do that and give them motion and movement and power and energy and meaning and history and love and life, well, that is indeed what poetry is all about, and then some. At this time, I'd like to ask if E. Ethelbert Miller could move to position to escort our first honoree, Miss Mary Evans, to the podium so that she can share her expressions of love and gratitude with you. We'd like to mention that Lucille Clifton, due to weather, which all of you have had an experience with here in Washington, was unable to be with us this evening. She sends her regrets and her regards and all of the love that she can muster for this great expression of love and tribute. Please welcome our first honoree, Mary Evans. There's nothing I can say uh, more eloquent than it's so gracious of you to be here. Thank you. It's gracious of you to have come and to spend your time during this day listening to people who took our work seriously. Uh, I think you're tired, and I'm happy and blessed. Thank you. I would ask that uh, our other noted laureate, Mahaki Mahabuti, please move into position to escort our next honoree, Nikki Giovanni, to the stage. <laughs> truly has been a humbling experience uh, to be here today. I do take my work seriously and I like to think I do good work, but I don't, you don't analyze your own work and you don't really know what it might, um, might mean. I, I am a graduate of Fisk University and we are uh, ever, our, our motto is her sons and daughter ever on the altar. And I think personally speaking, since this is more or less a personal moment, I've only had two times in my life that I've been actually humbled. And once I spoke at Fisk University during the, our crisis when, when uh, uh, John was the president. And in, in the speaking, I wanted to say to our students at Fisk and, and, and to, to, the, to the community that we continue, we must continue. And you never know what young people are gonna do because they're young and I used to be young and you never know what they're gonna do. And as I was leaving the stage, they, so it started on this side of the chapel, for those of you who know Fisk. And they sang the, 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 our, our song. They, they sang our, 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 our song. And, and, and I mean, it brought tears uh, to my eyes because that was a response to, to what I had said. Today was not a teary 
moment, but today was a humbling moment. I like to think that I am, well, I don't like to think that, I am 63. And this is a good thing because a lot of people in my generation aren't, and some who are don't know it, and some who are, are crazy and don't want to be it. <laughs> it's a good thing. I've been here with my dear friend and my good sister, Joanne Gavin. She's right up the street from me at, at, uh, at uh, uh, James Madison, and it's been wonderful. But more, if I may take a, another personal moment, my dear friend and good brother, Hakeem Adbuti. We've known each other since we were young, and we have grown old together. And this is and has been and will always be a good thing because that's what good friends do. We grow old together and we come together and we reach out. I have the pleasure of working with Haki on a book, Fisk Writes. Uh, uh, I'm gonna be at Fisk University next semester. Um, I'm taking a leave from uh, Virginia Tech and I'll be down. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about working with Fisk. Um, it's very difficult to go back to where you were when you were 19 or 18 or whatever you were when you were in college. But uh, Hazel, I'm a sucker for I need you. And Hazel O'Leary called me and asked me. And I said, sure, I'll be there. And I will. I have to buy a car because uh, my car is 20 years old. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to do that. And I'm not, I, I think I'm rattling, but I, I seldom do. And I know I've forgotten somebody. E. Ethelbert, I want to thank you for that beautiful piece. Don't give it to Mary. Give it to me. I'll make a copy for her. <laughs> that was beautiful. That was just beautiful. And it, it's good to be here at Howard. I am a member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority, as we know. Hey, I am. And as we know, Alpha Kappa Alpha started here. And as we know, Delta Sigma Theta grew out of Alpha Kappa Alpha. There's a sisterhood, is what I'm saying. And it's always good to be here at Howard because I am a Fisk University graduate, and without Fisk, Howard would have never emerged the way that it did. It <laughs> sure. That's true. They would have made Howard another Tuskegee. Nothing wrong with Tuskegee. <laughs> but because of the Fisk influence, because of the Fisk insistence, because of W.E.B. Du Bois, we ended up with Charles Houston. I just wanted to deal with, it's true, come on now. <laughs> come on now. I just wanted to deal with some connections. And I am proud to be a writer. One of my students uh, said to me, and then I will go to, one of my students said to me uh, on Tuesday, I teach the Tuesday evening class. She said, how come all you radicals ended up in the university? <laughs> and, and I said, because I couldn't see working in a corporation. But I like to think that as long as I'm doing good work, as long as my work continues to grow. And I think that from the beginning to the end, it's very strange to hear poems that I wrote 30 years ago because of where I am now. Acolytes, which is my new book, is a very sad book to me because it's the book that I wrote while sitting, what the Jewish people call sitting Sheva. My mother died and I, I couldn't stop it. I, I, there was nothing to be done. There was nothing to be done. She died. And in her dying, and I'm not the first person to, to lose their mother. It was just an incredibly sad experience, and I thought, I'm a writer, so I should write. And I ended up with that book, which went someplace else. And so I'm just trying to say thank you for the faith you've shown in me, Eleanor. Thank you so much. I, I, thank you all for, thank Black America for the faith that they've shown in me. And I hope that I continue to grow as an, as an artist and, and to put another thought out there and I'll be gone in the next 30 years or so. I hope I live that long. And I hope that somebody can come into some place like this and talk about what we did, because we did. We did good work. We did good work. We did good work.